You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. There's no shame in not understanding all the minute little details of a given political scandal. At least I sure hope there isn't, because some of them are nearly impossible to get straight without help. Here's an example. In the early days of the pandemic, remember those? The federal government wanted to build an app that would help travelers to Canada self-report their COVID test status, get themselves admitted into the country, and quarantine if they needed to. This was back at the time that things were being done really quickly, and money wasn't an issue, if it worked. Now fast forward almost four years. It is debatable if the app, which came to be known as ArriveCan, actually worked. But what's not debatable now is that money is absolutely an issue. Tens of millions of taxpayer dollars were spent on ArriveCan. Contracts were given out at warp speed to little-known companies who then subcontracted the real work. And now, there are hundreds of pages of reports and committee minutes and multiple investigations. There's even a nickname, Arrive Scam, coined by the Conservatives. But really, the whole thing comes down to this. Was Arrive Can a case of a government moving fast, trying to get things done with the best of intentions? Or was something else going on? What do you need to know about the Arrive Can scandal? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Iram Koja is a journalist with The Hill Times who has been covering the Arrive Can story for the past few months. Hello, Iram. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for having me. You are very welcome. And I'm going to start uh, with the simplest of questions for Canadians who did not travel uh, internationally during the pandemic and don't have this experience. What was the Arrive Can application? Well, very simply, the Arrive Can application was launched back in April 2020 for travelers at border crossings to submit their travel information, vaccination status, um, their COVID-19 test results. And um, it was mandatory for a while. It hasn't been since October 2022. And it was made for the Canada Border Services Agency, and it was meant to be basically an alternative to the public health agency's paper contact tracing form because that manual process of collecting information and digitizing it took up about 14 days. So it was about speeding up the process. You say it was meant to be. Uh, how did it work or didn't it work? Well, that's a good question. And um, I just want to emphasize, first and foremost, the big fuss right now is mostly about how the application was procured and why the federal government coughed up nearly 60 million bucks for it. But that's not to say that there is no scrutiny around like how effective it was, did it work, did it not work? And depending on who you ask, you will hear different takes on this. So let me explain very quickly, if I may. So if you look at this as a major digital tool that was up and running less than like two months after the pandemic started, right? You could say that it was a success and that's what the government is saying. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, we also have, you know, reports of other companies attempting and actually building similar apps in much less time. And the Canadian Border Services Agency says the app was downloaded more than 18 million times. It was used by more than 60 million travelers since its launch. And I think the latest info I have is that it's still being used around 300,000 times a month. And again, this is since the app no longer being mandatory since October 2022, right? So again, from the government's perspective, the application was necessary to ensure people's safety and it was effective. But on the other side, we have the Auditor General saying that 10,000 travelers were wrongly told to quarantine thanks to one glitch in one update in June 2022. The other thing is the app was updated 177 times. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, and um, again, more importantly, in terms of the procurement, we have the Auditor General saying we paid too much for this application. We have allegations of a contractor who received millions for the app while still working as a public servant. 
We have public servants deleting records of how this application was procured. We have senior public servants um, accusing each other of lying before committees. So there is a lot to talk about more than the effectiveness of the app. That's right. And that's why we're talking about it now. Two years after, as you mentioned, it stopped being mandatory. Maybe let's just begin with the basics. Who made this app for the government and for how much? And what do we know now about how that money was distributed? Okay, well, if only we knew. (laughs) Right. No, so we're talking about this now because we had some revelations, right, this winter with the Procurement Ombudsman review that came out, um, I think it was in late January, and then obviously the comprehensive report by the Auditor General in mid-February. So we finally have some concrete information that came through independent reviews. And I think prior to those findings, we didn't know much because it was really hard to even report on Arrivekin as a journalist because we had all these allegations that I just told you about and contradicting testimonies and committees And we wouldn't always be privy to all the information provided to the MPs as well. So I think all of this gained momentum once there was more clarity around like who the actors were, who got the contracts and how much they were paid and so on. And as for the contractors, there are more than a dozen contractors that build the ARIVCAN application, right? And that includes big companies like Microsoft and Amazon, but GC Strategies, this two person IT company was in the center of things because it was the primary contractor. It received uh, more than $19 million, according to the Auditor General. But again, if you ask the company's owners, they actually received $11 million. So again, it's like, it's really hard to know who received how much and who did the actual work. But in either case, we know now that GC Strategy has got the lion's share of things. And This was just an IT staffing firm, so they didn't do the actual development or maintenance of the application. So they're essentially headhunters from what I gathered, and they subcontracted multiple companies to do the actual work to get the ArriveCan up and running. And then we have this other company called Dalian Enterprises, and the contractor that received second largest amount, by the way, I think that was 7.9 million, again, according to the Auditor General. They say they provided software development, testing, project management, cybersecurity services. And the president of this company was allegedly also an employee of the Department of National Defense. And they've been uh, suspended from the DND. There is an investigation. So it's it's not really kind of simple, again, who got the contracts and how much they were paid. Right. And we'll get into who uh, those two companies are and and what we might learn about them. And, and one of the partners of GC Strategies has already testified before a committee. But before we do that, you mentioned, you know, companies like Amazon are involved in this process. How did it come to be? And maybe, you know, even just what has the government said about how it came to be that the two most expensive firms contracted out were these tiny little firms that nobody had heard of. Well, I mean, I can tell you that from what we know that the government's initial stance was that this was an emergency procurement. And what they say is along the lines of like, we did what we could under the circumstances, right? We're talking about like literally two months into the pandemic and they're trying to track who's coming in, who has COVID, who doesn't. And again, like through watching these committees, what I understood is when a solution is to be procured, right? A department in this case, that would be the CBSA, would just go to the PSPC and say, we need an application. So how do we go about getting this application? What should happen is PSPC looks for resources from what I gathered, which means uh, companies who can procure the solution. In this case, it would be, I guess, IT companies and such. And then once they detect people or companies who can do the actual work, they get to the, I guess, really cumbersome process of actually like procuring the solution. And then, you know, they have contracts and task authorizations and such. But what happened with this one is CBSA was already working with GC Strategies in other projects. And basically, I'm not going to get into the like whole uh, detail because it's again, very complicated and probably not going to entertain your general audience. But basically, GC Strategies ended up getting the biggest contract and they subcontracted other companies to do the actual work here. So they they are just an IT staffing company. They get resources and 
the resources do the actual work. But in this case, they got millions and millions more than the resources themselves even. And the main partner in GC, as I mentioned, uh, as you mentioned as well, testified before a committee last week. Maybe just tell me about that and and what did he have to say about uh, the Auditor General's report and where this money is? Because really, we're kicking millions of dollars kind of back and forth here with nobody uh, stepping up to really tell us where it is. I mean, it was an interesting week last week because we had Christian Furt and Darren Anthony, the two partners of GC Strategies, testified before the House Government Operations and Estimates Committee. They appeared uh, on different days. So the interesting part is both Furt and Anthony disputed the Auditor General's findings, actually, and they said they got closer to $11 million as opposed to the AGES estimation, which was a little more than $19 million. Like I said, we know that GC didn't do any work on the app, but it rather like brought people and companies who would do the actual work. And it was up to the CBSA and PSPC, as well as, I guess, many contractors and subcontractors to do the work and oversee it. So when when both partners appeared before the committee, they didn't take a lot of responsibility as to like why this ballooned to almost $60 million dollars because they didn't receive $60 million, they say, right? And um, one of the interesting findings about GC Strategies was that the company was involved in creating the parameters for CBSA's procurement process for the ARRIVECAN application. And the Auditor General said these, you know, the, the criteria was just so restrictive and narrow that it likely limited competition. Wait, they created the qualifications that their company met? Yes, exactly. According to the Auditor General, that's the case. And the company was then the only eligible candidate for competitive process, obviously, and was awarded a $25 million contract, which they, again, according to the Auditor General, they didn't get the full $25 million, I guess, but they've received uh, more than $19 million under this contract. Or as they claim, $11 million. Yes, exactly. As they claim, it's $11 million. And the AG also found that like there were situations where CBSA employees were involved in the Arrive Camp project. They were invited by contractors to dinners and other activities and such. So there's like a whole other aspect that involves like potential cozy relationships between CBSA employees and GC strategies. But again, these are all allegations that the Auditor General also looked at. It's really hard to say anything like definitive about whether or not there were cozy relationships as well. In the larger context, I guess, how unusual is it? And I know that these were unusual times, so that qualifier does apply. But how unusual is it for uh, the contracting out of an app to be handled in this way, with one company creating qualifications that only they meet? I mean, it seems highly unusual, um, especially since the Auditor General highlighted that. Them deciding on on the parameters of a contract, it seems very highly unusual, and, you know, MPs repeatedly pushed on this. The Auditor General's report obviously mentioned it. So I, I just, I mean, I've been in Canada for three years now, but I don't think there are any other examples of such thing happening. I also want to highlight the fact that, like the AG report said, the federal government repeatedly failed to follow good practices in the contracting, in the development and implementation of the ARRIVE-CAN application. So the gist of it is, is that just because this was an emergency procurement, it doesn't mean that all the rules are going to be out the window. And the AG said that, and the procurement ombud said that as well. And they've both kind of raised issues around like documentation and oversight and like lack of transparency and accountability in the procurement process. And again, just because this was happening during a pandemic, it didn't really justify it. Before we get to the political aspect of it and the government's defense and uh, opposition attacks, tell us about the other questionable contract given out, the second largest one, to allegedly uh, a person who was also working the other side of the aisle with the DND? So I can tell you a little more about Dalian's president. I think that's who you're referring to, David Yao. Yes. Mr. Yao, he used to work with the Department of Defense. So CTV reported back in February that David Yao was the president and the founder of Dalian Enterprises, but he was also an employee of the Department of National Defense. 
Again, he's since been suspended from the DND, and there is an ongoing investigation as far as we know. And this company, Dalian, got federal contracts through initiatives that support indigenous businesses. And according to the company, Yao served in the Canadian Armed Forces from 1987 to 2001. So that's before him founding Dalian in 2002. And um, since then, according to his company, he has only provided IT services to the DND through Dalian. And he did this job on a contract basis until September 2023. But I can say that like this whole potential conflict of interest initiated conversations about double dipping by retired or current public servants, which seems to be a notion like it is it is a known practice, I suppose, in the public service, but it's not necessarily talked about much. And it doesn't even seem like this is a new or like a liberal issue either, because as I was looking into this in the last couple of days, I've seen there was a case back in 2012 or something where a dozen contracts were awarded to a former public servant without competition. There seems to be a conflict of interest here, and it, it doesn't seem like it was specific to arrive can. It seems like double dipping is an issue in public service as well. And what has been... Obviously, there are processes that need to be reviewed, and that's why these committee hearings are happening. But what has the political fallout of this been? I mean, conservatives uh, and others are calling this a uh, arrived scam, which obviously implies something at the very least. Well, the conservatives are obviously calling this a corruption case, a liberal scandal, you know, wasteful spending by the liberal government, to say the least. And some MPs were pushing on contractors and CBSA officials to see if they have higher up connections in the Liberal government and so on. And again, I don't know if there is such connection between like Liberal ministers and these contractors that received millions for their work. But I can say that the independent reports we've seen did not really look into such connection or indicate or conclude that this is a Liberal corruption case. What has the government said in its defense uh, beyond, as you mentioned, that, you know, and, and this is understandable, that they were moving fast uh, in an emergency? Has there been any other announcement, any other review going on? Well, I mean, in the light of recent revelations, the government has suspended all three companies in question, GC Strategies, Dalian and Cordex. And Cordex, by the way, works in a joint venture with Dalian. So the money Dalian received uh, was shared with Cordex, to clarify. Uh, so all these companies were prohibited from participating in all federal procurements. Their security status were revoked. And, you know, we've seen liberal cabinet ministers acknowledging the findings in the Auditor General and Procurement Ombudsman reports as well. The Prime Minister called the situation unacceptable. He repeatedly said that authorities are looking into this and there will be consequences for anyone who took advantage of the situation to get themselves rich. So I think as things stand, I think the government response has been focused on the shortcomings in the procurement system and like potential wrongdoing by the public servants, as opposed to taking this as an issue that would reflect on ministers or the prime minister himself. But I want to I want to add something to that as well, because I know that like the conservatives are again calling this a corruption case and such. But conservative MP Stephanie Cusey told me in an interview that there are moments where she felt like someone's going to jail here. And there are moments where she thought, okay, this is just bad policy and bad oversight. And I have to agree, not only has it been a quite nail biter, but it, it seems like it can go either ways at this point. When will we know what way it goes? Um, what is the ultimate end goal of these hearings in this process? And when might we reach it? Well, if we're talking about the process, as far as I know, at the end of the AirVivecan study, the committee would prepare a report with its findings and recommendations and then present it to the House. And at that point, we would uh, we would see these findings as well. They would be public. And then the government would have, I think, 120 days, 120 calendar days, that is, to respond to recommendations. I think a, a really big part of it is whether or not there is criminality involved as well. That will define the outcome. Because we know that there is an RCMP investigation looking into allegations of procurement misconduct at the CBSA and the PSBC. That is actually stemmed from allegations put forth by 
another company called Butler AI based in Montreal, which did another project with the CBSA. So it's not specifically related to the Arrive Can. But we also know that the RCMP is not investigating, but assessing information out there available on ArriveCAN. And both of these investigations, by the way, uh, look into the actions of GC Strategies, the main contractor of ArriveCAN as well. So I think it, it all comes down to what the committee finds, but also whether or not the RCMP is investigating. If it is investigating, is there criminality involved? I don't want to speculate on how things might turn out. People may have their guesses. I do too. Mm -hmm. I just don't think we have enough evidence yet to reach a conclusion about what really happened and whether or not this is actually a big liberal scandal. I just want to add one more thing, though. The House did pass a conservative motion that asked the government to recollect all funds paid to contractors and subcontractors who did not perform work on the application. And they wanted proof of taxpayers' funds being repaid as well. So this motion is not binding and I don't know if things would come to the point where some of the money spent on contractors would actually be recovered, but I guess maybe that is a potential outcome too. It'll be fascinating to see what happens and now, uh, at least when it does, I will understand the background. Uh, Iram, thank you so much for this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Iram Koja, journalist with The Hill Times. That was The Big Story. For more, you know where you can find it, thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can also, of course, just scroll down in the podcast feed you're currently looking at, if you're looking at ours. There are now, at last count, more than 1,700 episodes of this podcast, which I find staggering, but I hope you enjoy. You can always get in touch with us to let us know what should be the 1,800th episode of The Big Story the easy way to do that is via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. The slightly more involved way to do it is to call us and leave a voicemail. 416-935-5935 is that number. The Big Story is available in every podcast player and it's on your smart speaker. Just ask that smart speaker to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Tomorrow.